Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this morning for the 18th Century Woman with Historic New England. Explore New England in the early colonial period from the unique perspective of middling and working class women. Review surviving original material that includes diary entries, letters, paintings, and objects to gain a greater understanding of what it meant to be female in New England prior to the American Revolutionary War. Uh, and this uh, program is presented by Gail White Usher, who's an educator and researcher working in New England's early history. She is uh, currently education coordinator for Historic New England at Roseland Cottage in Woodstock, Connecticut. Uh, Gail is also president of the Woodstock Historical Society and chairwoman of the Woodstock Historic District Commission. And again, I want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library, along with the libraries in Andover, Ashland, and Broughton for helping make this morning's program possible. So all 80 of us or so who are watching live and the hundreds that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Gail for joining us here this morning. And Gail, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be part of the Tewksbury Library's program series. And to all of you who are watching and have joined, I thank you very much for, um, for, for joining and for being a part of this. Let me get to my program. Here we go. Let's see if I can get most of the answers out of it. Well, Domestic Beings is one of a four-part series that emphasizes and explores the women of North America before 1800, the First Peoples and First Nations, African peoples and their descendants, European immigrants, and the interactions that take place between these groups. Let's see if I can get rid of this. Just a minute, folks. I'm going to see if I can't get rid of this piece here. All right. Women, you know, sir, are considered as domestic beings, and though they inherit an equal share of curiosity with the other sex, yet but few are hardy enough to venture abroad and explore the amazing varieties of distant lands. This is Abigail Adams. She's 26 at the time. She writes this from Braintree, Massachusetts in 1771 to Isaac Stevens. Well-ordered home is my chief delight and the affectionate domestic wife with the relative duties which accompany that character, my highest ambition. Now this is again is Abigail Adams. She's now 38, writing this in 1783. And finally, retiring to our own little farm, feeding my poultry and improving my garden has more charms for my fancy than residing at the court of St. James, where I seldom meet with characters so inoffensive as my hens and chickens, or minds so well improved as my garden. After hearing these words, and perhaps inspired by the portrait you see here of Abigail, I invite you to form a picture in your mind of the 18th century housewife. Now there are many surviving 18th century images of women at work. Often the women they depict are well-dressed, demure, concentrating on their gentle tasks. The images paint a quaint and romantic picture of a woman's life, such as described by Abigail Adams, or as we see here in this 1740 print, The Fair Seamstress by James Watson. This idealized picture of women's work has prevailed through the centuries, helped along by several surges in the colonial revival movement. Now, the most recent period occurred around the bicentennial. But it is at odds with the surviving words written by women at work. Diaries, letters, and even poetry exist that shed light on the domestic world of 18th century America. For example, in 1775, 18-year-old eight Abigail Foote of Colchester, Connecticut, wrote the following words in her diary. Fixed gown for prude, mend mother's riding hood, 
spun short thread, fixed two gowns for Welch's girls, card toe, spun linen, worked on cheese basket, patchled flax with Hannah. We did 51 pounds apiece, pleated and ironed, read a sermon of Doddridge's, spooled a piece, milked the cows, spun linen, did 50 knots, made a broom of guinea wheat straw, spun thread to whiten, <clears throat> set a red dye, had two scholars from Mrs. Taylor's. I carded two pounds of whole wool and felt nationally, spun harness twine, scoured the pewter. And then there is Molly Wright Cooper of Oyster Bay, Long Island. Molly married at the age of 14 in 1723 and was a grandmother by the time she was 37. Three months after her 55th wedding anniversary in 1778, Molly died at the age of 64. She and her husband, Joseph, both survived all six of their children. Molly wrote this when she was just 55. This day is 40 years since I left my father's house and come here. And here I have seen little else but hard labor and sorrow, crosses of every kind. I think in every respect, the state of my affairs is more than 40 times worse than when I came here first, except I am nearer the desired haven. The contrast between the surviving words of Abigail Adams, Abigail Foote, and Molly Cooper could not be more dramatic. Well, this talk investigates the lives of English women in North America of the middling sort and the working women. Women who lived in towns and villages and in settlements on the frontier at a time of exploding population, immigration, invention, war and conflict and epidemics women whose lives were dominated by hard work. We will use surviving original material, such as diaries and paintings, inventories, objects, prints, all of which help us gain a deeper understanding of what it meant to be a domestic being in the 18th century. And we'll compare this information to those popular English prints that show women at work. It has, become, it has been a tiresome day to me. It is now bedtime and I have not had one minute's rest today. Molly Cooper. A woman's world centered on her home. For many, this was the, homestead, the farmstead, often a large holding that included the house lot, which is the, the up to one acre directly surrounding the house. Fields, gardens, woodlots, barn, ponds, barns, and outbuildings. This circa 1720 cape with its circa 1760 addition is typical size for a home in New England. The kitchen was the center of the 18th century house and the space where a woman and her daughter spent most of the time. It was busy with the work of raising and caring for a family. Women's work in the kitchen included cooking, baking, and food preservation, churning butter, making cheese. Women tended as much as a one acre vegetable and herb garden that provided fresh produce for the family, as well as the herbs that seasoned food, kept the family healthy, and were used to clean the house. Women took care of chickens, assisted with the butchering, milked the cows, and performed other work as needed. For example, Molly Cooper again writes in 1773, I am forced to climb the cherry tree and fetch the bees down in my apron. The kitchen was dominated by the fireplace with all of its equipment. And most kitchens were well and heavily equipped. In 1728, Nathaniel Coffin um, provided his daughter with the essentials to set up housekeeping as she began her married life. And he uh, created a list, a brass kettle, two iron pots, two skillets, 
two basins, two porringers, a chafing dish, a box iron, and two candlesticks, eight platters, bales for the pots, two skillet frames, a gridiron and flesh fork, a fire shovel, two porringers, a pair of bellows, a pudding pan, he specified seven inches, a brass kettle, and a bell metal skillet. Now let's take a closer look at some of these essential, some of this essential cooking equipment. Of course, we're all familiar with the iron pots that really were the center of the, the most essential piece of, of equipment in a front for uh, a kitchen. They were heavy, um, molded iron, that average weight, about 14 pounds, and they would hold soup or stew for six to eight people. Most were made of iron, um, but they also could be made of copper. Smaller ones could be made of copper or brass. And they were suspended over the fire in the fireplace by an either trammels like you see here, here on the left. These are ratcheted trammels. They are adjustable. So basically adjustable hooks. They sit over a lug pole um, that crosses the fireplace or on, along the top of the crane. And then the pot is adjusted up or down by using the ratchet. And one could also use S hooks um, to set the, hang the pot on the crane over the fire. Um, gangs of S-hooks, chains of S-hooks could also be used to adjust the height. Also in this photograph, we, in this slide, we see the peels. Those were either iron or wooden long, sh basically shovels. Uh, what I tell students when I'm teaching is that they're similar to the peel you would see in a pizza oven, but they were used to place uh, food for baking into the bake ovens. Other essential pieces of equipment are skillets and spiders. Both had legs so that they could sit over hot piles of coals on the hearth of the fireplace. Um, and that was the secondary method of cooking. A woman used a fireplace shovel to take out hot piles of coals and place them on the hearth, um, creating in effect burners, just like the tops of our own our, our modern stoves. And these footed skillets, spiders, and as we'll see in another slide, pots would sit over those piles of coals, generally for quicker rather than long-term cooking. They often had um, many of these, these um, spiders and skillets had longer handles. They it created some distance between the, a woman or a girl, whoever's cooking on the, at the fire, between her and the fire itself. Hooded pots, also very common, and these uh, this is what I was speaking of previously, also sitting over piles of coals. They were mainly used for cooking smaller amounts. They're quite a bit smaller than kettles, um, heating up sauces, uh, melting ingredients. Also here in the slide, we see salamanders. They were used for, um, for uh, grilling um, uh, wrote over the top. You'd heat them up over the fire, place them on top of your food on the top of a pot and it, it seared the top. And uh, very heavy waffle and wafer irons, popular pieces of kitchen equipment. They were toasters. And this is a kick toaster. And that means that this, the piece of the toaster here, this part swivels and you can swivel it by just spinning it with your hand or with a foot. Um, and so that you're able to toast both sides of the bread. And I will say that the, uh, rather the designs of the grill that actually held the slices of bread would then, this is design would be toasted into the bread. Gridirons as well as griddles also very common pieces of equipment. Now in this wonderful print, um, you'll see in the background a kettle uh, for boiling water. And those kettles were quite 
heavy and hefty, again, made of iron. They could weigh uh, aver on average about seven pounds. Um, that's empty. Um, and this something this size would hold about three quarters of a gallon of water. You wouldn't brew tea in it. You would just use it to boil the water that you needed for making either your tea or your hot cocoa. Now, one of the most essential pieces of equipment is the flint and steel, um, the fire starting set. And most every woman, girl, by the time they're 12 years old, is quite skilled in starting a fire themselves. Um, the steel is the critical piece here. It's iron that it's steel that has been hardened to a a certain level of hardness. It needs to be slightly softer than the stone, the flint, that it will be striking. And uh, base and this the other pieces are char cloth, which is usually linen that has been, easiest word is cooked um, in a container until almost every, everything possible has been burned off and you're just left with basically char, charcoal cloth um, that if you scrunched it in your hand would, dis, would really disintegrate into dust. But it is sufficient for containing for a brief, brief seconds a spark that is generated by striking the steel on the flint. And then a tow, um, a flammable material um, that once air is blown onto it when it contains the char cloth, begins to burn slowly and you use that to start your fire. Um, every kitchen contained, uh, had a container that had all of these essential pieces of equipment. So even though a woman attempted to, um, by carefully banking a her kitchen fireplace when she went to bed, attempted to keep that fire um, so that it would restart in the morning, when she got up, uh, things happened. And this allowed, with the, this skill, um, allowed her to quickly set a new fire. Now, many families just used wooden plates. Um, that was very common, especially as the, for um, the lower classes, pottery, redware plates were also common. The family also ate their meals on metal pewter plates. Um, and all of those metal, well, all dishes required cleaning. And the, that work involved getting water from the well, heating it over the fireplace, pouring the heated water into a tub, and then washing the dishes with soap that you probably made yourself. Pewter, brass, and copper needed to be scoured to, um, to be cleaned, and that involved using brick dust or sand. Oops, I'm gonna back up here. Um, Molly Cooper, again, in 1769 writes, oh, I am tired almost to death waiting on visitors. My feet ache as if the bones were laid bare. Not one day's rest have I had this week. I have no time to take care of my clothes or even think my thoughts. Did ever poor creature lead such a life before? She was 54 at the time she wrote this. Now, women tended uh, the women. A woman and her daughters tended the kitchen garden, which could be as large as an acre, and in it they grew most of the vegetables that the family ate, and also the plants that flavored and preserved food. They were used as medicines and helped keep the house clean. Um, they uh, a, a compilation of some of the uh, plants, the seedlings that were planted in one garden. Um, were transplanted hundreds of seedlings, and this is Martha Ballard's garden. Um, sowing, weeding, she gathered the harvest, she gathered seed, fresh vegetables, and she, some of the, and culinary herbs, beans, cabbages, parsnips, turnips, beets, cucumbers, radishes, onions, garlic, peppers, carrots, turnips, lettuces, and melons.
Now, women compiled receipt books to record recipes, common recipes that they used or unusual one recipes, uh, things that were of use to them. Mehitable Chandler Coit um, was a young woman who lived from in, in the, whose life spanned the late 17th century into the about the middle of the 18th century. She was from originally from Woodstock, Connecticut, and then relocated in, to New London. And she kept a diary. And in it, she recorded, among, in addition to events in her life um, and in, information about the weather, and she had a method of destroying the putrid smell which meat acquires during hot weather. Remember, they have no easy means of, no means of refrigeration. So the meat intended for making soup, you put it in a saucepan full of water and scum it when it boils and then throw into the saucepan a burning pit coal, very compact and, and this is key, destitute of smoke. Leave it there for two minutes and it will have contracted all of the smell of the meat and the soup. If you wish to roast the piece of meat on the spit, you must put it into water until it boils. And after having scummed it, throw a burning pit coal into the boiling water as before. At the end of two minutes, take out the meat and having wiped it well in order to dry it, put it upon the spit. So basically she's using charcoal to remove the rancid smell of meat. But alongside the that very useful recipe, she also had one for making gingerbread, which, and it's a very simple receipt. Just three pounds of flour, one and a half of sugar, three quarters of butter, two ounces of ginger, and six eggs, and a little rose water. Um, and that's a common method um, of recording a recipe. No instructions, just the ingredients. Now, early cookbooks, such as those by Hannah Glass and toward the end of the century, Amelia Simmons, became popular. Again, these were compilations of recipes for diverse purposes. They could include not only just food, but also um, a, in instructions on making wine or ale, uh, remedies for illnesses, and instructions on various household chores. Now, churning butter and making cheese were two of the labor-intensive ways uh, to preserve food. A fortunate housewife had daughters for these chores or household servants. And we see this romanticized print from 1760, The Industrious Dairymaid, contrasted with a, a perhaps a probably more, more realistic print showing a woman and her daughter churning butter. A family usually had at least one cow. Female members of the family were responsible for milking and for preserving the milk. What wasn't used in cooking or consumed was turned into butter and cheese and significant amounts of butter and cheese. Daniel Benton, who lived in Tolland, Connecticut and died in 1777 um, on, upon his death, um, his inventory records that he had 78 pounds of cheese uh, that was in storage. His son, Daniel Benton II, who died two years later, I, I, excuse me, one year later, um, in addition to beef and pork uh, and pickles and fat, had one tub of cheese, one churn, 24 pounds of butter, 58 pounds of cheese, and 27 late made cheese, and we're pretty sure they mean 27 pounds of late made cheese. Women were responsible for the domestic fowl on the farm, and that's chickens, geese, turkeys, and ducks. Now I'm going to, we'll take a minute and pause and reflect, uh, remind ourselves on the peacefulness of rural life. Before we head to the next aspect of women's work, which is caring for the health of the family. Women were the first line of 
of action when it came to uh, sick members of the family, um, just as a um, uh, just as parents are now when they're raising with, with their children. And uh, and women were very very most women were very skilled at handling the simple in injuries and illnesses that could could happen in a family. It's only when things became more complicated and serious um, that they turned to dramatic, more interesting recipes and receipts, and also potentially turned to outside help, such as a physician, if there was one in the neighborhood or in the town to help with the illness. Mehitable Chandler quite recorded this recipe for all sorts of fluxes. Now, fluxes are intestinal illnesses at serious intestinal illnesses and diseases. And you can see by the list of ingredients that she has that it calls on quite a number of things. She has milk, two quarts of new milk, two nutmegs, 18 peppercorns, 18 cloves, a penny's worth of cinnamon, twice as much of the outward bark of an old oak tree. Give it at four times, the first time as hot as you can drink it, the next time, not so hot. Give it at four o'clock in the morning and at four in the afternoon and at night. And on the same page, she also recorded, make an ointment good for a scold head. Um, and I'm not really sure whether she meant cold in the head or a scalded head. There's no indication. But she takes millet, which is a seed, um, sorrel, John work, English sorrel, wood sorrel, columbine leaves, and house leaf, bruises them together. Uh, that means she's using a mortar and pestle. Puts them creamed in an earthen pot, which she buries in the ground for nine days and then boils into an ointment. So this is a, a re recipe that would need to be done ahead of time and is kept on the, in the larder, in the pantry, in anticipation of needing it. The production of the family's textiles occupied the majority of a woman's time that was not spent in the kitchen or in the garden. It was, of course, a gentle pursuit, as we see in this image titled Domestic Amusement, The Fair Seamstress from 1764. Girls learned to sew by the age of five. Most were accomplished seamstresses by the time they were 12. At 12, a girl often began nearly a decade-long project to, to produce the textiles that she would need when she set up a household upon her marriage, which usually occurred in her early 20s. Now, Nanny Green Winslow, at the age of 12 in 1772, recorded that she sewed on the bosom of Uncle's shirt. She mended two pairs of gloves. She mended for wash, two handkerchiefs. She sewed on half a border of a lawn apron of aunts, read part of the 21st chapter of Exodus and a story of the mother's gift. A home contained a significant number of textiles, as we see in this inventory of Daniel Benton, again, from 1777. He has one feather bed, an underbed, a bolster, pillows, and the bedstead rope bed, a mat, a valance, and curtains belonging to the parlor bedstead, a sheet, and curtains. He has a pair of woolen sheets belonging to the above bed, one coverlid belonging to the above bed. In the bedroom, one feather bed, an underbed, rope, and bedstead, bolster, and pillows, balance, and sheets and curtains. One pair of linen sheets belonging to the above bed, one coverlid, one ditto. In the chamber, one feather bed, an under bed, bolster, bolster pillow, bedstead, rope, and bed mat. A pair of woolen sheets belonging to the above bed, one old bed quilt, one flock bed, bolster, under bed, trundle bedstead one woolen sheet and one woolen blanket, one coverlid and ditto, one bedstead and rope bed, one linen sheet, 
one ditto, one ditto, one ditto, one pair of pillowcases, one ditto, one pair of ditto, one pair of ditto, one pair of ditto. Uh, so it, it strikes me that the those taking the inventory did not want to write out pillowcases. One bolster case, two tablecloths, six towels, and one Lindsay woolen sheet. When we say bedstead or bed frame, we're talking about a bed that looked like this. Um, it is the support for the mattresses, or the is this network of ropes. So in that inventory we just read through when it said bedstead and rope, um, that's the ropes, this is bedstead, this is what they meant. Um, the bed could also be a post bed and have higher posts. The bed mat would be lay over the ropes and add additional solidity to the frame and the ropes. When they mention bed curtains, they're talking about something that might have that looked like this. Um, many beds, particularly the best bed, um, which was often in the parlor, um, was was curtained, curtained for privacy and curtained for warmth. Um, when the woman is is there, they're one of the main projects that a, a girl is um, working on when she's preparing the textile she needs to set up her house. And this, in this case, this is a post bed, and the, the so this is a there is a frame that with balance back panel, and then the four curtains that are that hang around the bed. Now women also spun wool and flax to produce wool and linen yarn and thread for cloth and for sewing. And here again, one of those wonderful prints, the lovely spinner of 1760. Most households had both flax wheel and wool or walking wheel. And girls learned to spin at an early age. In some families, uh, um, it, the use of the walking wheel if, um, was, was assigned in particular to one, um, the older girl, perhaps an unmarried aunt who was living with the family. Uh, it took, there was a, could be a significant amount of work involved in spinning the wool that a family might produce. If the family had sheep, then wool carding tools were essential tools that younger girls used to prepare the wool for spinning. One sheep could produce between 10 and 15 pounds of wool fleece, and that required significant preparation to be spun. Um, the carding tools were used to comb the wool, straightening the wool fibers so that they were all going in one direction, removing any last bits of um, twigs um, that or debris that might be in the wool so that it is the fibers are luffed and ready to be spun into yarn or thread. And if you recall Abigail Foote's um, diary entry um, when the, she, she noted that she fixed a gown for prude, she mended mother's riding hood, she spun short thread, she fixed two gowns for Welch's girls. She hatcheled flax with Hannah doing 51 pounds a piece and that's a significant amount. She carded toes, she spun linen, she pleated and ironed, she spun linen again and this time creating 50 knots of linen. She spun thread to whiten it, she set the red dye and she finally, she carded two pounds of whole wool using those carding, carding tools similar to the ones we just saw and felt nationally because this is during, just before the start of the Revolutionary War and point of patriotic pride that she's, they're using wool for their, they're producing wool for their clothing and she spun how to harness twine. So in this record of Abigail Foote's work for the day, uh, then there's a significant amount of time that is given over to 
working on the production of textiles. And when we speak of hetcheling, um, this is the tool that we're talking about. Um, this is a flax hetchel. They're, rel they're really quite um, mm, uh, imposing tools and quite crude. And there are a hundred nails that are pounded uh, into a board. They come in three separate sizes. This looks to be the either the large or medium size. Um, the, there's a fine, a medium, and a coarse. Um, and and flax um, is a it's, is a stalked plant, very very thin thin stalked. The fibers for flax are inside the stalk, uh, and it's it's multi steps. It takes about eighteen steps to go from you first plant the seed in the ground in the spring until you have um, you're ready to actually sew a garment out of linen. But flax needs to be combed, similar to how wool needs to be combed. But because it's so coarse and because the fibers are so long, um, you needs a different tool. And uh, what happens is that the fibers are drawn, really combed through these this bed of nails, and you when as you step down to successively finer nails, um, it really smooths and smooths the fibers. And you go from something that's very, very coarse and, and scruffy down to something that, that really resembles blonde hair. Um, when we're finished, when I finished with the slide presentation, I've got a, examples of that that I can share with you. It's dangerous work. It's easy to get your hands um, cut very badly on these nails. And and Abigail Foote's diary is one of the few that I've seen that talks about women, a girl specifically, hatcheling flax. It's, it's generally been more associated with, with, um, men, with men and boys. Um, so I find her diary entry that she, she hatcheled flax uh, and, and did 51 pounds a piece, particularly intriguing. Needlework and embroidery were domestic employments, as we see in this print, that were also necessary. Young girls perfected their skills on samplers and embellished, and then embellished their pockets. They might become skillful enough to produce works of art, like this quite beautiful embroidered wallet. Bed rugs were similar, singular examples of large needlework projects that could be undertaken. And these bed rugs are, um, they are particular to Colchester, Connecticut and the region around Colchester, Connecticut. Um, uh, they are, they use heavy yarns um, to produce the, the re really elaborate patterns. But perhaps the most, the single most important needlework that a woman produced were the bed hangings that surrounded her marriage bed. And here we see what's considered the finest surviving example of bed hangings. Now they could take years to create. And these, this is the, the Bullman bed hangings. Um, they were produced by Mary Sweat Bullman in Old York, Maine. And they were produced by, by her before 1746. They are all embroidered. We call that now cruel embroidery. Um, they're in the possession now of the Old York Historical Society. Um, and what, what uh, Mary produced was not only a complete set of curtains, back panel, but she also produced a bedspread, and then the valance is embroidered with a variety of sayings. This is a monumental piece of work and demonstrates her skill as a needlewoman. The girls and women also knit. Um, we see here a girl knitting in Philip Mercer, Mercier's um, print. 
They knit socks and hats, scarves, mittens, muffetees, all manner of warm, warm clothing to, to, for the winter chills. Pape looms, such as these that you see here, um, were used by women and girls to produce tapes. They are narrow gauge woven bands. Um, they could be any length. Um, they could, they you were typically between two inches and an eighth of an inch in width. They held the 18th century together. They were used on as the back lacings often of men's breeches. They were used to lace to, for the um, drawstrings on women's skirts. They were used for flower sacks. They were used to tie your curtains onto your bed frame or into your windows. There were many, many uses uh, and they were essential, an essential part of 18th century life. Some women were adept at creating beautiful, beautiful lace. This is bobbin lace she's got. She's using wooden bobbins, um, working on a pillow to produce this beautiful, beautiful bobbin lace. And of course, all of these textiles needed to, to be washed. And so I ask you to compare these two prints, Woman Doing Laundry by Henry Moreland with this one, I, I think a touch more realistic, Domestic Employment Washing by Richard Houston after Philip Mercier. I think her expression perhaps is much more telling about the work, arduous work of laundry. There was also starching of certain garments and bluing. Bluing was uh, adding a blue, which is indigo and a combination of indigo and starch to your washing to whiten up, to whiten white clothing. And then of course, there was that gentle domestic art ironing. We see here in a maid ironing by Henry Moreland. We all know how easy and delightful a job ironing is. Perhaps that's um, a bit, Molly Cooper's words are a bit more um, descriptive of the job of ironing. She says, I am tired almost to death I am drying and ironing my clothes till almost break of day. And then again, she says, oh, I am sick all day long, up very late, but I have got my clothes ironed. Now work was done in daylight and by candlelight. A family used on average between three and 500 candles per year. They were made from tallow, which is beef fat, um, and it's a fairly time-consuming process and dangerous process to produce candles. Uh, Ma Martha Ballard in 1788 says that she has made 29 dozen dipped candles. I will say candle dipping, candle making usually involved the entire family and was done outdoors often. Now, of course, during her, women took care of children. Um, there, to them fell the task of raising the boys and girls of the family. And during her married years, a woman could be pregnant as many as 20 times if she survived. The average family probably comprised about six children but all, all too often, a woman gave birth at least a dozen times, only to lose some of her children, either in childbirth or in infancy, or lose her own life. And this is, this is a particularly um, wonderful painting in the Worcester Art Museum of the Savage family that, just, that, that shows the, the full scope of a family. You have Mr. and Mrs. Edward Savage, um, his father, a man, another male relation, perhaps his brother, and then all of their children.
Death was an ever-present part of a woman's life. She lost brothers and sisters, parents and children, spouses, friends, and acquaintances. And here we see the really poignant, poignant painting um, done by Charles Wilson Peel of Mrs. Peel lamenting the death of her child. In 1777, Abigail Adams wrote, Join with me, my dearest friend, in gratitude to heaven that a life I know you value has been spared and carried through distress and danger, although the dear infant is numbered with its ancestors. It appeared to be a very fine babe, and as it never opened its eyes in this world, it looked as though they were only closed for sleep. My heart was much set upon a daughter. And Molly Cooper in 1771 writes, this day is 11 years since my dear son Isaac departed this life. Sorrow, sorrow and loss, unspeakable. Now Molly Cooper's diaries are an evocative counterpoint to the quaint print, prints and paintings that we looked at that depict women in the domestic, at their domestic duties. But documents such as Molly's are rare. Most surviving diaries of the period are more like Mahitabal Chandler Coit's. They contain sporadic entries about significant events in a woman's life, marriage, births, deaths, moves, comments on the weather, perhaps recipes. While the prosaic images we've examined and Molly's diaries represent two ends of the spectrum of women's work, when you combine them with surviving objects, we, get, we gain valuable insight into just what it meant to be a domestic being. And I will close by reading to you the rural woman's lament. Ruth Belknap wrote this in reply to Edward Taylor, the local minister who, who had preached a sermon about women's duties. Says Ruth, up in the morning I must rise before I've time to rub my eyes. With half pin gown, unbuckled shoe, I haste to milk my lowing cow. But oh, it makes my heart to ache. I have no bread till I can bake. And then alas, it makes me sputter, for I must churn or have no butter. The hogs with swill, too, I must serve, for hogs must eat or man will starve. Besides, my spouse can get no clothes unless I much offend my nose, for all that try it know it's true. There is no smell like coloring blue. Then round the parish I must rise and make inquiry far and wide to find some girl that is a spinner. Then hurry home to get my dinner. All summer long I toil and sweat, blister my hands and scold and fret. And when the summer's work is o'er, New toils arise from autumn's store. Corn must be husked and pork be killed. The house will all confusion filled. Oh, could you see the grand display upon our annual butchering day? See me look like 10,000 sluts. My kitchen spread with grease and guts. You'd lift your hands surprised and swear that Mother, Mother Triscuit's self were there. Ye starched up folks that live in town, that lounge upon your beds till noon, that never tire yourselves with work unless with handling knife and fork. Come see the sweets of country life displayed in Parson Belknap's wife. And finally, again from Martha Ballard. A woman's work is never done, as the song says, and happy she whose strength holds out to the end of the race. So Thank Gail, you. yep, Gail, wonderful job as expected. Uh, let's take uh, roughly 10 minutes of questions here. Uh, Gail, let's see. So Eva Jane asks in the chat, weren't boys taught some of these skills and tasks, especially if there were no girls in the family to do this kind of work? Generally not. There were fairly clear delineations of male, the male domain and the female domain. 
Um, and frequently what families might would do is if there were absolutely no girls in the family, then there would be a, um, a swap, if you would, a woman down, a family down the road that had uh, more than enough girls and not enough boys would send their daughter down. They wouldn't give their daughter away, but they would send their daughter down to work and learn from the woman who had no daughters. And this, the family with many, many sons to spare would, might send their son up to help out and learn from um, the family that only had daughters. So there was that, the, uh, uh, there was a casual arrangement, nothing formal and you weren't giving up your family, but it was a way for, um, for all the chores to be handled and for people to get the help they needed. So I think that that the answer to that question also answers Philomena's question, who asked, uh, what did womenless households do to survive? So I think uh, we'll uh, say that that answered that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think my favorite question, uh, an anonymous attendee asks, so what were the men doing during all of this? So you, so you outlined uh, all the tasks that uh, women completed. Uh, what were the men doing? Now, the men's domain, if uh, let's just say far on the farm, um, men had two main areas of responsibility. And the first was, and most important, was providing for the family, um, which included working the fields, all the planting the big field crops. Um, it in, and, and in, but a man also had a trade at that time. So most men had basically two responsibilities, the house and farmstead and their trade. The blacksmith also probably has a farm of some size that he has to operate, has to maintain. Um, so they are just as busy. The average family uses about 40 cords of wood a year. A man and his sons are spending every available moment that isn't spent at his trade or on other farm duties getting procuring 40 cords of wood ahead for the next year mm -hmm. so they're busy and in their there's slaughtering that needs to be done um the men are heavily involved in the harvest well harvesting obviously but flax production and harvesting they're involved in that um they've got the sheep to deal with so everybody is busy and if you've got a farmstead and a trade all trying to work together to support this family, um, mm -hmm. then everybody's busy every minute of the day. Uh, speaking of sheep, uh, Kathy says, all that wool, how did they keep the moths away? Any ideas? Well, the, some of those herbs that, um, well, let's see, I'll first start to say they didn't. There was just no way you could keep moths out of the clothing. Um, but the some of the the herbs, the plants that women grew in their gardens, um, had insect repellent, moth repellent properties. And so, whether it's um, sage, pennyroyal, um, various different motherworts, um, they were they were plants that would um, discourage moths. Um, and then, of course, in the winter time, um, your upstairs of your house is going to freeze solid it's going to be whatever the outside temperature is so in new england that means that if you've got any clothing stored out there you've got a high likely up in the attic um then you've got a high likelihood that you're killing the moths at least for those clothes that are up there um speaking of herbs and gardens and food uh barb asks uh did women have salt to cook with they did salt was one of those um uh, items that they might would procure from the general store, but salt was readily available. Uh, another question. I think I heard you say that embroidery skills were considered a necessity. I can see how knitting would be, but why embroidery? Could you talk a little bit more about that? Mm, not, not a necessity. It's part of the needlework the whole panoply of needlework skills that were that that a um, a girl was taught, mm -hmm. and the and the uh, samplers and then were were a good way to practice that those fine sewing skills. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, and a girl was considered accomplished if she could do fine embroidery. So um, could someone get by without knowing how to um, do elaborate needlepoint? Absolutely. But it was what young girls were, one of the things that young skills that young girls were expected to have. Uh, let's see, Jody asks, how common was it for women to be able to read? And if they did read, what did they read? Uh, the Bible? So yes, that's that's a the quick, simple answer. Most homes um, had a Bible. And so, and that was the book that was read the most. Girls did go to school, whether a dame school in the village or a regular school. Um, they would go to school. They weren't expected to be um, extremely well educated. Uh, I've read. I read at one point a description that girls needed to be able to read a little bit, write their names, do a little bit of math, um, and that was about it. That the bulk of their education was in preparing them at, was at home and it was preparing them to sometime in their early 20s become wives and mothers so that there's a between the time you're three years old and the time you're about say 21 or 22 there's a lot of intense training in those domestic skills that needs to be accomplished it's not to say that there were not some well-educated women, and then that depended on the family. Uh, upper classes more likely than the middling and lower classes, and it depended on what your father felt was appropriate for you, and then you read whatever books were in his possession. Uh, so I don't want to go too far past noon, and we'll take uh, two or three more questions. Uh, as we start to wind down, folks, uh, let Gail know in the chat if you enjoyed this morning's program. So uh, we'll take a couple more questions, and in the meanwhile, um, let Gail know in the chat if you enjoyed today's presentation. I also, uh, so want, I, if I want, I did want to show folks what that, um, let's see if I can get myself in here to see, me, so I can make sure that I'm showing you. So toe, so flax um, is a very thin stalked plant. Inside these very thin stalks are, I don't know if you can see the little fibers coming off it, are all these fibers, mm -hmm. right? The process of getting that involved, that the stalks are broken, the fibers are extracted, and eventually you end up with this mess that's full of pieces of stalk and stem and we all, all kinds of plant material. That hetchel, as you, the hetchels, the three sizes of hetchels are what turn this mess into what something that looks a lot like combed blonde hair. And what, what it does is it straightens the fibers, it, extracts, it pulls out, just like when you comb your own hair, you pull out, some, some hair comes out, it pulls out the short scruffy fibers that aren't suitable for spinning. And it, it continuously combs and straightens and uh, the longer fibers, these aren't really long enough. Uh, a good long, good long fibers are probably anywhere between two and three feet long. Um, so it it's straight, but it straightens them all out and gets rid of all the twisted two short ones. The short ones are toe. They get um, combed with wool cards and can be spun into, um, into toe. It's coarse thread that might get, and yarn that might get woven for really coarse cloth. Um, it's also one of the, toe is also a great fire starting piece. That was that wad of material I showed there. And then the long fibers are, are, are spun into thread for either lint, for linen cloth or for sewing. Uh, so Gail, a couple more questions. Diana says, is there any documentation, <laughs> easy for me to say, is there any documentation concerning how many hours on average women slept given all their responsibilities? I don't think there's, I don't think, I haven't seen anything, which is not to say that somebody um, hasn't 
done the research to find it out. You're you're not going to a woman, no one is going to stay up too late generally stay up too late into the darker hours of the night unless they're caring for a sick family member or unless they've got work that absolutely must get done that night they get up in the morning at break of dawn that is you know they are they're up early 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 um to start the whole day going so you know it's I, but I don't, I've never read anything that specifically states the amount of sleep they got. I would guess that there were, many of them were sleep deprived. <laughs> so I know you talked about um, arrangements being worked out between families if one family didn't have a female. Um, but we did have a couple questions and comments around, uh, around this uh, thread here. Uh, Barbara asks, how many families hired domestic help uh, such as to assist with laundry chores? Uh, so it, it would depend on the family's circumstances. Um, if they were able to afford um, a hired a hired servant um, and whether for specific chores or on a regular basis, mm -hmm. some did. I don't have the percentage of those um, that could, and it would depend a lot on are you living in a town or are you living in a, um, a, a very rural, small community? Mm -hmm. uh, people had enslaved people as, you know, to do, help with their chores. Again, depending on, on, on their financial status, what they could, what they could afford. Um, and they also had indentured servants and indentured servants are, were men and women who, um, hired themselves out, bonded themselves out for a period of time, could be up to 10 years to a family. And the family usually paid for their passage from England to the colonies and then would have them as a servant, um, an owned, almost a rented servant um, for a, an extended period of time. Uh, Often they were treated um, as badly or in some cases worse than enslaved people because there was no, no sense of need to, to care for them. Hmm. But, but okay. the advantage of an, of an indentured person was that they would eventually work off their indenture, finish their period of indenture, and then be able to go about their lives. Right, right. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna end it there, uh, Gail. I'm gonna say a few words and then throw it back to you for any final comments you may have. Uh, so, folks, just a reminder: uh, you'll receive an email from me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, a link to this recording, information about some other upcoming historic New England programs, and uh, I'll include Gail's bibliography. Uh, so, I want to thank you all for joining us, Gail. Do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap up? Uh, no, just to thank you all very much for for your patience and your your attention to this, and I hope that it's provided a little bit of insight into what uh, the domestic beings of the 18th century were, and just the prodigious amount of work that women um, women accomplished. Well, I think it's fortunate that we. Uh... We all uh, live in the century that we do. <laughs> but uh, so thank you all so much. Thank you, Gail. Great job as expected. And I, I hope to see many of you at a future uh, program. Thanks again. Enjoy your kids.